a voz del box, Mr. Lupe Contreras. Thank you very much for returning to the boxingbar.com and welcome, my man. Good to be back. And Lupe, man, first question, man. I mean, I've been seeing you all over TV since a, a year and a half since I've had you on. You know, is, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Having all these different gigs that you've been having, I think uh, I see you more often than ever before. You know, uh, how do you feel about that? And uh, what's going on in your life? Well, I can only be positive. We've had a lot of opportunities these past uh, year and a half. It doesn't seem like it's been that long. But yeah, there's been a, a lot of great opportunities in the in the past year and a half. I've had the chance to basically uh, go all over. We recently, you know, came off the the world tour, as I called it. We did, uh, I think, it was about 60 hours on an airplane in a matter of, of of a month or so. Went to Mexico City, New York City, Las Vegas, uh, San Juan, um, Macau, Beijing, Hong Kong. Uh, so it was quite an adventure, and and it, it can only be a positive thing to be seen. And you know, recently we we've, we've been hearing about all you know the split and the promoters and the networks and all that stuff. Has that or does that affect you in any way, in a positive way, in a negative way, or does it affect you at all? You know, how how does that go as far as you and your job and what you do? Well, the way it affects me is the fact that I'm contracted with Top Rank, so I've been signed to do exclusive uh, fights with Top Rank, and that's the way it affects me. Um, overall, I think it's a it's a positive thing with uh, what you've seen. I think it makes for for better competition and and you know although it it does affect the people that are involved in boxing directly, um, I think that only good things can come out of it for boxing fans. And I think that's what's really important. What you're going to start seeing is you're going to start seeing those uh, what I call showcase fights basically disappear. There are going to be no there will no longer be any easy fights on HBO or on Showtime. Um, and I think we we've, we've started to see some of that. You know, you saw the uh, fights like uh, Chad Dawson and Stevenson uh, this past weekend, uh, Jose Cito Lopez and Maidana, those are pretty competitive bouts that uh, have been put on, you know, for the most part, cable TV, if not free TV. And uh, I think the boxing fans are going to be the ones who win because at this point, you know, boxers and promoters are being uh, asked by those channels to put on the best fights possible. And, and like I said, the only ones who, can, who, can, uh, who are going to benefit from that are the boxing fans. I think that's what's important. And actually, that pretty much answers what my next question was going to be, which was, do you have you, you know, seen being there front row, you know, have you noticed a difference in the the competition and the fights themselves, knowing that they are competing against each other, and because of that, they're putting on better fights now. And I mean, we've been seeing fight of the year nominees now. It seems like since then, since they did that split, you know, because of the competition and because of how fights are being put together now to compete against each other. I guess you did answer that by saying what you just said, but have you seen that, you know, directly from your point of view? It, it has, and I mean, and you're going to see this coming up. Uh, we have a, an ESPN fight coming up on July 12th. We have a guy by the name of A.B. Han going up against a kid from uh, from New Jersey, Glenn Tapia. Both these guys are undefeated, and they're, it's relatively early in their careers, but, but they're being forced or, or the way the situation is now, you have to prove yourself a lot earlier. You know, you got these two guys whom, whom, like I said, they're, I think they're probably still in their teens as far as the number of fights that they have as a pro, but they're being, you know, asked to go up against one another. And I think that's something that, you know, before this whole competitive thing happened, I don't think you would have seen it. Um, and I think that's what you're going to see a lot more of, guys being asked to prove themselves a lot earlier. Uh, on the undercard of uh, uh, Provodnikov and, and Bradley, we had uh, Jesse Vargas against uh, Wally Amatoso, two undefeated guys that were asked to go up against one another again relatively early in their careers. So I think that's what you're going to see a lot of, and, and I have seen it firsthand, where these fighters are being asked to, to prove what they've got. Promoters are investing you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, into fighters, and they're looking for a return on their investment. And uh, they want to see you know, earlier rather than later what you have to offer. Yeah, and I was there for that fight. And, you know, before I got into boxing, I was a big professional wrestling fan, believe it or not. And I, I remember during their heyday when it was uh, one promotion against the other promotion on Monday nights, they made for the best or, or the biggest uh, TV audience ever in the history of any TV network, just knowing that they were competing against each other, knowing that people were flipping back and forth on channels, even though it, it, it sucked for us in a way. But it was great as far as competition, and when you actually saw the fight, and for the quality of the fight, it, it brought out the best in, in the two fighters. And I, you know, I, I agree with you 100 percent on that. Yeah, and I think you're going to see more of that. When you bring up all this stuff about traveling, I mean, obviously you travel a whole lot. I, what would you think of that, man? I mean, traveling, for, you know, here and there, and I think you do something like what over 50, 60, 70 gigs 
a, a year, that's a lot of traveling for you. You know, how, how does that affect your personal life? I do like it. I mean, there are certain aspects of it that uh, that can be a bit difficult at times. When flights are delayed, when flights get canceled, when things don't go as uh, as you had planned them, that's when it can be kind of tough. But the traveling is great. I get to see, you know, I've, I've made friends all over the country, if not all over the world, uh, and I've gotten to see some things that I only dreamed about. As I mentioned to you earlier, when we went to, to China, I got to see the Great Wall. You know, never... Never as a kid growing up in Houston or, you know, or coming from the background that I come from, I would ever think that someone like myself would have the chance to be standing at the Great Wall or the Forbidden City or looking at the, the skyline of Hong Kong. And thanks to boxing and thanks to some of the opportunities I've had, I've had the chances to do that. It can be difficult in the sense that we're working when, when most people are out having a good time. So that's where it tends to be a little bit hectic. Uh, we work on Fridays. We work on Saturdays. That's when you have the, the quinceañeras, the weddings. Um, and what I've noticed is kind of ironic is I've gotten a little bit more well-known and, and more popular. I get more invitations to those types of things, but I can't make it because, you know, we always have something going on. So it can be a little bit difficult on the personal side, but what you do is you turn it into a, a working vacation of sorts. Um, you get a lot of frequent flyer miles. I take my parents quite often with me to places. Uh, I've invited friends to go along as well. And so that's where it tends to be, you know, it, it's not hard to get people to, to go with you to, to Puerto Rico or Las Vegas or New York City. Everybody's always willing to go. So it's, uh, there's ways around it, but I, but I truly enjoy it. You brought up China, and uh, we've been seeing uh, fights there in China, especially with Lu Ximing that's coming up. And I believe there's a card coming up uh, in July. And, of course, the Batman Brandon Reels fight against Pacquiao in October. Why is China becoming a hotbed of boxing? Is it for top rank to maybe uh, have a nice fresh start in a fresh area where maybe we haven't seen a lot of that in the past? I think part of it is the fact that you have a, a growing economy. You have an economy that um, that basically is, is flourishing at this point. You have a lot of construction, a lot of money to be spent. Uh, Macau is a tremendous place. You go out there and, and you think Vegas is over the top. Well, you haven't seen you know Macau. It's it's you know, even more outlandish than, than some of the stuff you see in Vegas. And I think part of it is just the, the vision of, of Bob Arum. You know, the guy has always been somebody whom, uh, whom has been looking at different places for different opportunities. You know, he's the type of guy that, you know, was looking in Asia to, to find, you know, the next boxing superstar. He brought Manny Pacquiao. Uh, he went into Latin America and, and some of the, uh, you know, in the 70s and looking for some of the, the Latin stars as well. So I think he's just a guy who, who, who you know, for lack of a better term, things outside of the box and things beyond the borders of the U.S. and just looks for, for things to happen. And, uh, and you have a, a crowd that's, that's hungry for entertainment. When we last did the show in, in Macau, uh, the fans, you could tell that they really weren't familiar with boxing, but they were really enjoying what they were seeing. I mean, it's not often you see, uh, you know, 10,000 people cheering for a, for a jab or reacting to a, you know, to a fighter missing a punch or whatever it might be. So they were really excited. It was something new for them. And, um, and I think they're just looking for a different type of entertainment. And I think Bob and, and Top Rank are, are looking to fill that void. You brought up Bob Arum there. What do you think about Bob Arum and what he does and, like you said, his vision in, in this sport? And what do you think of Bob Arum uh, when you think of that name, you know, the head of Top Rank? Do you see him as just a boss figure? Or is there, a, you know, something else that you see him as besides, you know, your boss there? Well, I mean, what I think of, of Bob is just a really hard-working guy. I mean, he's, he's by no means just a figurehead. He's a guy who's, who's in the mix, and he's, uh, he's in the office all the time and looking to do different things. Um, you know, he's the type of guy that I, I've seen him, or, well, I've not seen him, but I've heard of him flying to the Philippines because Manny Pacquiao requested he be present at, uh, at one, of his, one of his parties, and, and to keep Manny happy, he flies out there, and that's like a 22-hour flight, and, and the guy is... You know, he's in his 80s, if I'm not mistaken. And those fights can be, can be tough on you. Uh, when you have the world tours or the, or the press tours that they do, he's on those things. You know, he, he's at every stop. Uh, he's always working hard. You know, the, the media gets in front of, uh, of Bob, and, and Bob will talk to the media. You know, he, he knows how to promote. He knows how to make sure that people know about a fight. And I think he's always looking for, for different angles. You know, he was kind of the, the first guy in recent, in recent times to – not only focus on the car, but also focus on the venue, you know, putting fights at, at uh, Cowboy Stadium, putting fights at Yankee Stadium, doing different types of venues and different types of events, which I think, uh, you know, kind of always gives it a little bit, a little special spin to it. Uh, you might have had certain cards that perhaps weren't all that spectacular, but the fact that it was the first card at Cowboy Stadium, you know, it, it gives it a whole different spin to it. And, 
and people want to be there. People want to be a part of the event. And I think he knows the secret to, to doing that. And, uh, you know, I certainly admire him. And, to you know, for people to think that he's just a figurehead, it's, it's, they'd be completely wrong because this man works really hard at what he does. You know, I don't have a lot of interaction with him, but uh, the times that I've, I have had um, interaction, he's always been with me, and he's exactly what you see on camera. When you see the way Bob talks and what Bob says, that that bothers him. He's not putting on a show. It's not a caricature. That's exactly who you get when uh, when you're face-to-face with him as well. Yeah, I think you, you might have touched the subject on the last interview we had, but how did Bob Aram find you, or how did Top Rank find you, or you know, how did that come about where you became part of that group, part of that family there? Well, what I did was I won a contest uh, when he was young, and um, Top Rank were looking for someone to replace the announcer they had on the old uh, Solar Book Sales series. I entered a contest, which was called La Voz of Books, and I won. And they basically got me to do one of the events as, as a live audition. And uh, it was pretty informal. I mean, it was a case of they said, you know, hey, you know, we like what you did. What are you doing next week? And I'm like, nothing. They're like, okay, well, you're going to be here. And I was like, okay, cool. And, and then they said, well, what are you doing the week after that? And I'm like, well, I'm not doing anything. They're like, okay, well, you're going to be here. And it just kind of snowballed from there. I started working with, with top ranks and started working with other promoters. Uh, as you know, the boxing community is very small. If you work well with others and, and uh, you do a good job and, and you make – I think most importantly, and, and it's something that I can't stress enough to other people, is that if you make other people's jobs easier, they will keep calling you back. And basically, that's kind of been my niche, where I go in there and I do what I have to do. I, I try to do as good a job as possible and uh, you know, make their job a little less stressful, and they're going to keep calling you back. And that's Absolutely. And that's exactly what happened with me. Were you ever intimidated at all? By oh, yeah. by Bob Arum or by working at Top Rank when you first started, of course. I mean, I'm sure you're more relaxed and, and doing all that stuff now, but were you at all intimidated knowing, hey, you know what, you know, this is what I've always, this is kind of like a dream shot here. I'm doing this. I won this uh, the competition that you joined for La Voz del Box. Were you ever at all intimidated uh, in that first few months, years oh, that definitely. you started to do this? It, it, it took a while to really get comfortable when it um I mean, I, I had done two shows previously to uh, to doing the televised show, but I basically went from from uh, you know two shows to everything I did being on television, um, and it was one of those things where it was a bit of a whirlwind. You're like, oh my god, what what have I gotten myself into? Can I really do this? You know, am I am I prepared to handle all this stuff? And before you know it, other things started coming along. You know, the I believe I was I was uh, in the business maybe about six months or so when. Uh, I think Michael Buffer couldn't make it for one of the events, and and I got called in to do a, an HBO, which basically was like, wow, you know, I, I uh, when I won the contest, I thought they were going to give me, you know, my commemorative T-shirt, a commemorative DVD, and say, hey, we hope you enjoyed it, and, and you know, show this to your grandkids one day, and uh, it just basically snowballed from there. So, yeah, when you when you're standing at the ring in the ring, there's even been a couple of times when when I look across the ring and it's like, holy crap, that's Evander Holyfield or. You know, that, that's Julio Cesar Chavez across the ring, and it just it just uh, kind of takes you to a different place when you realize, you know, years ago I was sitting on my couch watching these guys on pay-per-view, and now I'm, I'm, I'm part of this uh, boxing circle. So, you know, at times it's still a bit of a reality check, and, and there are moments when, when you sort of do get intimidated, especially at uh, some of the bigger shows. Um, but the key to it is just to remain calm. And people always ask me, they're like, do you get excited? And I said, you know what? I try not to get excited because if I get excited, I, I get nervous. And if I get nervous, I start screwing up. And the last thing you want to do is screw up when you have only one chance to do it and one chance to get it right. But uh, there are definitely some, uh, some other fine moments, and there have been quite a few in the past 12 years. And I remember you telling me that you before you did this type of stuff, you did radio. Was the first time you did announcing, was that the first time you were actually, you know, somewhere center stage and performing, you know, standing there in front of a mic, in front of a lot of people. Well, was that the first time you did something like that live? No, actually, what what uh, helped me a great bit was the fact that I had been in radio. And in radio, you do different things. You, you do live remotes. You know, you go out to car lots, uh, concerts, nightclubs. So you're used to dealing with a hostile crowd. Uh, up to that, to that point, I had done, uh, I think, the biggest event we had ever done. We had gone on stage to bring on, uh, there was a, a, a festival with, uh, with the late singer Selena. And we were bringing her on stage, and I believe there was like 25,000 people there. So there were there were some pretty uh, big events that I had been a part of. Um, I had never been in charge of, of, you know, being the MC or conducting the entire event like like it is now. But it certainly was, you know, a good way of preparing myself for for what was to, to lie ahead. 
so it's uh, I did have some some brief exposure to to big events and and just doing things live and being uh, having to improvise or or getting one crack and one crack only. So it it certainly helped a lot. Um, it, it it basically I came with a with a certain set of skills that they were looking for. You know, I was a big boxing fan. I had a broadcasting background. Um, I sort of had the basics for what they needed to mold, and so it, it really worked out. You know, almost serendipitously in the sense that. You know, I had what they were looking for, and and uh, I was at the right place at the right time. And what were some of your thoughts or emotions? I mean, you brought up how you introduced uh, Evander Holyfield or Julio Cesar Chavez, who you used to watch on TV. But what were some of your thoughts in your mind or emotions you were going through, let's say, when you were walking towards the ring uh, before announcing those two guys or one of those two guys uh, and being in the ring uh, before announcing their, their names and knowing that they were the guys you used to watch on TV? What, what type of thoughts run to your mind uh, during that time? You know, basically, I think... I'm just telling myself to be cool, you know, trying to try to pretend like you've been there before. Uh, a lot of what what we do is a, is a performance, so in order to perform, you have to, you know, pretend like you've been there before and try to be as professional as possible. Uh, certainly, afterwards, when you reflect on it, you realize, uh, wow, you know, I can't believe I actually got the chance to uh, to present some of these guys. Um, and so, it, it is a roller coaster of emotions, but most of the time, it happens afterwards. You know. Uh, Especially when these guys remember you as they, as they, you know, you see them along the way. They'll say hi, and they'll remember that you did this fight for them or you did that fight for them. So it's, uh, it, like I said, it's almost an out-of-body experience in the sense that you can't believe it's actually you in the ring with all these guys. You just feel like you don't belong for some reason, and that's basically the way, I, the best way I can put it. Just kind of trying to be cool and trying to pretend like I actually belong in the ring with these guys. And your interaction with all these boxers that you announce or that you just see in the in the locker room, you know, whether you, you'd be going through to get your information straight uh, before a, a fight card there. I mean, you know, how, how does it feel being back there in the locker room, having to interact with everybody pretty much in the card or, or seeing them often or seeing them grow up pretty much? You know, I'm sure you've seen guys when they were pretty much rookies to, you know, when they hit, hit a world title shot or, or whatever it might be. Do you see a lot of that and see people grow up in the front of your eyes and interact with a lot of those boxers, you know, outside of the ring? That's probably the coolest part is just watching them develop. I started basically at the same time with, uh, you know, the, the Antonio Margaritos, the Miguel Cotos, the Juan Malopez, those guys, and just to see them go from making their, their pro debuts to, to what they've eventually become, it's, it's really quite, a, quite a, a sight to see how they develop. You know, guys like, uh, you know, El Canelo Alvarez, I did his first fight in, in the U.S., and I believe there was maybe, was it maybe 300 people at the Morongo, if that, you know, and now you see him selling out the uh, the Alamo Dome, or they're going to be selling out the MGM Grand. And, and it's really great to see how these fighters develop, how their careers grow, how they grow as athletes, and how they grow as personalities as well. As far as outside the ring, I really don't have a lot of interaction with the fighters, not for any other reason than just I'm not that, that social, you know. I'm not really a guy that goes out a whole lot or, you know, there'll be some casual highs and some buys and some brief conversations. But uh, as far as a lot of interaction outside of the ring or outside of the locker room, I really don't do a great deal of that. Um, but it, it's is there is there like a code that they tell you? Hey, you know what? No, don't no, interact with them no too much. I mean, there, there's people that do have very close uh, relationships with the fighters. Like I said, I just don't happen to be very social. It's it's one of those things where people uh, people picture you being a lot different, or they picture you being you know that you go to Vegas and you're getting the VIP treatment, and you're going into all the clubs and hanging out at the pool, and you know it's just not me. Uh, some guys do that, but it just doesn't have to be me. Um, I'm more of a, you know, let's get something to eat and I'll be in my room by 11 o'clock. You know? So it's not, there. there's no necessarily a code. Uh, it's just different personalities. And, and you have some fighters who are like that as well. You have fighters who are much quieter than others. You have fighters like, you, know, you got guys like Bam Bam who are cracking jokes every two seconds. Then you got other guys like Miguel Cotto who you couldn't make them smile if his life depended on it. You know, it's just different personalities that, that, uh, that get in the same spot by the simple fact that, that they're connected by boxing. And um, you're going to find, you know, people that are a little bit more vanilla and a little people that are a little bit more extreme or that are a little bit more flavorful than others. And I think it just uh, to each his own. And, uh, and I think that's basically where, where I fall into, where I'm just, I'm just not that cool. I'm just not that outgoing. So let's say you get to the arena 
on the day of a card. What what are your duties from there? I mean, you get there and from there, you know, what what happens? I mean, do you go to a certain person and get some cards to, you know, to go by or do you go make your own cards or how does that go? Well, typically I'll get my information emailed the, the night before. Once the weigh-in concludes, we'll get all the, the official records, the bout sheet, the weight, uh, the officials. And I try to do my own cards in the room before I even get to the arena. A lot of when you first get to the, to the arena, you know, you're saying hi to a lot of people, you know, get to see a lot of people you haven't seen in quite a while. So there's a lot of small talk and a lot of conversation. So sometimes that kind of eats into your prep time. Uh, but I try to get there at least an hour and a half to two hours before the actual event. Uh, I'll check in with uh, with our PR guys from top rank, let them know I'm in the building and not to worry about, you know, trying to find me. And then I kind of go into the locker room and I start talking to the fighters. I start, you know, a lot of fighters will change. You know, they used to be from, from L.A. and now they're training out of Bakersfield, so now they want to say they're from Bakersfield. Um, I try to get the names as as close to what they they should be pronounced like as possible. And sometimes you get some challenging names. We had a we had a guy from Georgia this this weekend. His name was spelled M T C H E D L I S H I V I L I. You know, so, which I think is worth like you know ten thousand points in Scrabble. And I've always wondered about that because I've always that there's times where I've seen like a boxer announced from a certain area. And then on his next fight or a few fights later, you'll see him announced from a different area. And I've always been like, you know, how do they know what to say or why are they claiming, you know, different areas? I've never understood that. Yeah, I mean, fighters are just like that. You know, they sometimes it gets really complicated. They want you to say stuff like, you know, I was born here, but I'm living there and I'm training out of here now. And it's like, man, we only got so much that we can say. It just gets so convoluted after a while. But uh, and I just go in and try to, you know, check their information. I also want to make sure that, that what I say matches the graphics on TV. That's very important. You know, TV doesn't want you saying stuff that's not appearing on the graphics. So you kind of have to, you know, go by that rule as well. Um, and you just try to make everybody as happy as possible. And, and like I said, I think it's, it's a sign of respect to go in there. And if the guy's name is pronounced a certain way, you pronounce it that way. Or you, print, or you say whatever he wants you to say. And um, so basically I do that. And then about the last half hour or so, I try to stay as close to the ring as possible, wait for my cue to go in there, and, and then from there, it's pretty much let's go, and the, the fights come out pretty uh, one after another. And um, and once the, the night is done, we're done, and, and you know say our goodbyes to everyone in the house, and, and, uh, and then we're free from there. As stupid as a question as it might be, how, how much of a positive is it to be fluent in both English and Spanish. I mean, it seems like no other guy I can think of across the way that, you know, can't speak both as good as you. You know, I, I know it's helped you out in many ways. I mean, even a lot of people might see you as, hey, he's he's a Mexican person, but, you know, there's a lot of countries that use Spanish, whether it be Spain or Argentina or, you know, all these, you know, countries coming up with all these great fighters. But, uh, you know, how does that help you be fluent in both languages? Well, look, I wouldn't have it just otherwise. Uh... Like I said, when I, when I won the contest, they were specifically looking for someone to be bilingual. Uh, obviously, it was on a Spanish network, so you had to speak Spanish. But we were doing a lot of U.S. venues, so you had to speak English as well. And that's sort of what helped me in the sense that there were a lot of guys that spoke uh, Spanish very, very well, but they kind of lacked on the English side. Um, and although Spanish is my first language, English is my dominant language. And um, and that helped me quite a bit. And believe it or not, one of the, one of the most common emails I get is from people in the Philippines of all places, where they're like, we are so glad that you pronounce Nonito Donaire instead of Donaire. You know, they're like, his name is Donaire, and we hate it when people don't say it correctly. And that's the most common email I get uh, complimenting me on the fact. You, that you know what's funny it. is I didn't know that, and I've I've heard you pronounce it Donaire, and I've always thought like, okay, you were doing it in a Hispanic way, but I didn't know that they actually like that or that's how it's really pronounced no, that's in the, the Philippines. Pronunciation. As a matter of fact, I, I went up to uh, to Nonito and I said, hey man, how do you want to pronounce? Do you want to pronounce Donaire or Donaire? And he's like, no, no. He goes, my name is Donaire. He goes, say it that way. And I was like, okay, you know, it came right from the horse's mouth, so that's what I went with. Um, and no, that's probably one of the, the most common emails I get from the Philippines is that, hey, you know, we like the fact that you pronounce names correctly. And uh, so it's definitely a huge advantage. You can go in there and, and oftentimes I'll translate for fighters. You know, the, the commission, a lot of times, depending on where we are, won't have bilingual people. So, you know, I'll help them out and I'll translate or I get the chance to communicate directly with them when but I couldn't. And um, it's a tremendous advantage. And like I said, without it, I, I definitely would not be where I am now. Absolutely, and I've always applauded you, and uh, 
uh, a commentator or you know host uh, Bernardo Osuna. You know, you guys have fluent. You, you guys are both fluent in both English and Spanish, and what you guys do, and that's great. Especially knowing that you know, it's us Hispanics. You know, sometimes we're we're with their, our family member there watching boxing, and when when they get everything you know translated in a correct way, it's uh, it, it's great for all parties there. Do you have any pet peeves in your profession and what you do? Is there anything that really gets to you? Uh, you know, you know something that happens, you know, behind closed doors, something that you don't like, or things that happen often there in your profession. I do. One of the things I hate the most is once I started talking and we're doing the live event, I hate it when people come up to me and try to tell me things as I'm talking. You know, like uh, whatever you have to say at that point. I, I, one, I cannot listen to you because we're live on the air. And believe it or not, you, I have people more often than not tap me on the shoulder or, you know, I don't know if they realize that, that we're live on TV and there's no, there's no second takes. You know, whatever you have to say at that point, they're either trying to give you additional information or trying to tell you, hey, hey, say this, say that. Make sure you say he's this or that, the other, you know, either you know, that he holds this title or, or that he's ranked number one or number two. And it really bugs me that, that they do that. You know, to me, it's the equivalent of the bell rings and you're tapping a fighter on the shoulder to to say something to him while the other guy is punching him in the face, you know? Uh, another thing, too, is what a lot of people don't realize is the mic signal has two signals. You have the signal that goes to the PA system, which you hear in the arena, and then you have the signal that goes to TV. So oftentimes, perhaps the DJ will forget to pod you up for the PA in the arena, but you're potted up to television. So when they give you the cue, even though you can't be heard on in the arena, you're being heard on television. So you got to keep going. And I often tell people, I go, believe me, no one is more upset and no one is more aware of the fact that I cannot be heard in the arena than me. So, you know, I know they're trying to be helpful and they're coming up to me like, hey, 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 you know, no se oye, no se escucha, or hey, we can't hear you, we can't hear you. And all they're doing is just distracting you, you know. And like I've, told, I've always told people, I said, believe me, no one's more upset and no one realizes it more than me that I cannot be heard in the arena. But, you know, you have, sometimes you have 2,000, sometimes you have 1,500 people in the arena, but you have millions watching you on TV, and that's what matters. And, and once the, the queue comes, you got to go, you know, whether the whether you can be heard on, at, in the arena or not. You still have to go and, and do your intros regardless of what's going on. So those are my two pet peeves, those two. And when the DJ is not paying attention, we had a, we had a DJ in uh, Boston, and he was just into his music, man. He was, you know, and I realized, you know, typically when you're a DJ, you are the entertainment, but at this point, your job is to play music in between the fights or while, while there's nothing going on. And if you hear a bell, you know, cut the music and turn on the mic, you know? Otherwise, uh, people can't hear what's going on inside the ring. And this guy was just spinning and grinning, as I say. He was, he was playing his music and forgetting to pod the mic every single time, and it, and it got really annoying after a while. Hey, you're right. When, when it's live, you know, you only get one chance. There's no second take there. Hey, you're you're absolutely great on your delivery. And you know what's funny is that, you know, just like you give us great delivery on, on your work while you're working, you know, you have, you know, for, I have you on Facebook as one of my friends. You have great delivery on stories, man. You have some great jokes and stories that you tell, and you have a lot of people laughing. I, I can see, you know, a lot of people get a kick out of what you got to say, you know, from all these experiences you might have traveling or, you know, from the airports or meeting all these people that you meet. Describe your personality because I... I would think you were a jokester or you were very social, but a little bit ago you just finished saying you're not too social. Just kind of like give us a little rundown there. What do you think of your personality? How are you outside of your profession? You know, what's funny, there's a, a fighter in Oxnard named uh, Javier Pelos Garcia, and uh, he sent me a message one time. I, he's on my friends list as well. And he sent me a private message, and he's like, hey, I just wanted to make sure this was really you. He goes, because in person you seem so boring. And he said, but on... But on Facebook, you come up with some crazy stuff, and and that was kind of part of part of my reason for having the the Facebook is that I was really surprised at at the impression that people got of what you were like from you know I mean maybe I'm on I'm on TV for a couple of seconds, and I've had people say all sorts of things to me like, man, you seem so religious or you seem so this or you seem so that, and I'm like, really, you know, just from from those few seconds you see me on camera, you you derive all those things and and which were completely wrong about my personality and so I, I thought it was important to at least you know let a little bit more of, of what i'm like out on facebook you know i talk about boxing but really a lot of times it's just whatever good ideas come to my mind um and it's just a way of letting people know a little bit of, of the insight as to what i'm like i'm kind of i'm kind of silly i have a 
uh, you know, kind of a, a sick sense of humor sometimes. You know, a lot of times people don't always get it. Uh, and that's all right. You know, just as long as some people find it funny, I, I hopefully don't offend anyone. I try not to. But it's just one of those things where if, if people always say, man, you're always on Facebook. And I say, no, I'm not always on Facebook. I'm on Facebook a lot, but I'm not always on it. What I'll do is if something, if something pops into my head, I'll go to Facebook, I'll write it down, and, and I'll walk away and I'll leave it alone, you know? And then, uh, but I'm not, I'm not there waiting for the comments to come through or, or you know, on the 24-7. So it's just one of those deals where it just gives people a little sense to what I'm like, uh, maybe to dispel some of the, uh, the misconceptions that others might have of you. As I've always told people, what you see on camera, no one is really themselves on camera. Anytime you have a, a camera on you, you're either a little bit more reserved than you normally are or you're more over the top than you normally are. And what we do is basically a performance. It's the same way as if, you know, you're being paid to be the villain on a soap opera or you're being paid to be the good guy in a soap opera. It, it doesn't necessarily reflect who you are, but that's what they expect of you. So that's what you give them. Uh, but once the camera's off and once you're, you know, you're on your own little private time, then it's, it's cool to be who you are. And, and like I said, I'm more quirky. Um, as I mentioned to you before, I'm not, I'm not really social. I'm not much of a party guy. Uh, I'm not a drinker. I'm not a smoker. And so maybe, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not the life of the party. I can, I can converse with just about anyone, but as far as being the guy that, you know, that's, uh, that's popping champagne or doing uh, all sorts of crazy stuff, I'm, I'm not that guy. I prefer much more low key, much more, you know, subdued type of, of events. But, you know, I'm, I, I'm amicable, but I'm, but I'm far from social. And I'm, that's probably the best way I can describe myself. Hey, it's so funny that you brought that up, especially knowing that you brought up a guy from Oxnard, you know, Javi Pelos Garcia, who's a nephew of Robert Garcia. But uh, it's so funny you bring up what he said. You know, I didn't know he said that to you. But at the same time, that's how I would probably see you, too. You know, I would see you as a guy that's uh, always see him in a suit. He's always very professional. He always delivers the information. So I, I kind of picture in my head, this guy's like a guy that would be your teacher. You know, to see that you joke around the way you do, especially on Facebook. It's kind of like, wow, this guy is really funny. This guy goes from being someone I see like a teacher to being like almost a comedian over here because you really make people laugh. And I'm sure you get a lot of response from you know all these people that read what you got to say because it's some funny stuff there. Well, yeah, no, I, I get some, some good responses and I get kind of like uh, some, wow, you know, where did that come from? So I guess I do it to entertain myself and just kind of give people a little bit more of an insight as to what I'm really like. And like I said, and, and not everybody's going to like it, and, and that's okay. You know, I think if everybody likes it, then you're probably not being true to yourself. So exactly, like I don't think it's that they don't like it. I think they probably see you as this professional figure that doesn't mess around, that's really serious. And when when you say something that's you know funny, they they don't know how to react to it. You know, so they probably see it as. With a I think, funny I think coming I've destroyed quite time. a few images that people had of myself there for a while. <laughs> well, I guess, hey, that's what I really <laughs> am, so. And well, what's your private life like, Matt, if you don't mind me bringing that up? I mean, I've never heard you bring up, like, a wife or kids or anything like that. Are you living the single life or, you know? I am. I mean, I've never brought them up because the wife and kids don't exist. Um, <laughs> I, I live on my own. It's basically, you see my roommate, Pingo, if you've ever if you've ever been on Facebook. He's my, my little... Uh, I'm not sure exactly what kind of dog he is. Like I said, he's made, <laughs> he's made from spare parts. I don't but, think anybody uh, knows what kind of dog that is. I, no, I, I have like to see said, the His tail's too long, his body's too long, his head's too small. But, you know, like I tell my mom, he's he's small and ugly, but he's far from dumb. So he keeps me company. Uh, I live in Houston, which uh, I think a lot of people, for some reason, think I live in Los Angeles. I get that a lot. They think I live in either L.A. or Miami, but no, I live in Houston, Texas. Um I am. I'm, I'm a single guy. You know, no children. I have, you know, a ton of nephews which come over and and uh, hang out here quite a bit. And basically, that's it. You know, just living the social life. I'll probably end up being that old man that chases kids off his yard, but that's okay with me if that's the way things turn out. You know. <laughs> do you think that has to do with you know all your traveling? Do you think that has to do with your personality? Well, I mean, what do you think that that you don't have somebody? I would think it has to do with the, all the traveling you do. You're not in one place at one time, so you can't really you know, carry a, a relationship, I, I wouldn't think anyways. It could be that simple, but I think it's probably more complex than that. I'm probably not, I'm probably not all that easy to, to live with, probably. Uh, you know, I'm a very tranquil guy and a very easygoing guy, and I think sometimes people misconstrue that as uh, as someone who doesn't care. You know, not to get too Dr. Phil on you, but I've had people tell me, man, I want, I want a bigger reaction out of you, you know. They either want me to be a little bit more angry, a little bit more happy, and I'm just kind of middle of the road, you know, where... 
I try not to get too upset about things, and I try not to get too excited about others. And uh, I think sometimes people, when when it comes to amorous relationships, I think people sometimes want extremes, and I, I don't give them extremes. And I think that that might be one of the reasons. And and then two, who knows? You know, I've never really been very traditional. Uh, I try to do things uh, a little bit out of the norm, and uh, and perhaps that's that's one of the things too. You know, I think uh, especially being you know being Mexican, you're expected to do by age 25, you should have at least one or two kids. And that's never really been a, a, a big aspiration for me. You know, it's never been, I've never, it's never, I've never aspired to become a parent. And, you know, certainly I have no, no qualms about being married or, or, or being in a long-term relationship. It's just something that just hasn't worked out. And, you know, I don't want people to think I'm sitting at night crying with my dog at the fact that there's no Mrs. Contreras. But, you know, it's just one of those things that just never worked out. We brought up uh, Oxford earlier, and actually, Bellos Garcia, who's from the first family here of Oxford, the Garcia family. Uh, you worked on a documentary, or you helped out in a documentary there about them and their life. What was your role in that documentary, and how did that go? Well, I was approached by Chuy Santillan, who's the director, producer, basically the, the one-man gang that uh, they got that uh, to come to fruition. Uh, we met at one of the events at the Home Depot Center. If I'm not mistaken, it might have been... It was either either Rio Salvarado or uh, the first one. I believe that was the event. And uh, he came up to me and he said, hey, you know, I'm looking for someone to narrate this film, and I wanted to be somebody with, you know, boxing ties. And I, that's something I had always wanted to do. I've always enjoyed the 24-7 documentaries and, and some of the other ones that you see on, on television. And I think broadcasting-wise, narrating a documentary or something that, that takes, you know, 20, 30 minutes or an hour and being able to hold the attention of, uh, of an audience is probably one of the hardest things you can do because not only do you have to tell a story, but you have such a, in such a way that it entertains people and it holds their, you know, their attention. Um, and so he approached me about doing it. He sent me over a script, and as a matter of fact, we started kind of, I got a little bit more deeper into it than I had initially thought. I thought it was just going to be the narrator. And then we started sharing some ideas, and, and uh, we made some rewrites. I helped with some of the writing, and uh, we went into the studio and kind of hammered it out. Um, and as a matter of fact, I still have not seen the film. I know several people have seen it, uh, but for some reason, w- one of the times that Chewie and I got together to look at it, uh, he brought over a laptop with a, on, a, on a hard drive, and for some reason, the hard drive wasn't compatible with the laptop that he had brought, so I didn't get a chance to see the film. But uh, it's something that I'm, I'm proud to be a part of. Like I said, Oxnard is, uh, is one of those places that, that just kind of sticks out. You, know? you would think that such a small place with uh, such a... How would you say where you, where you have certain aspects of it that that kind of work against youth, you know, uh, in the sense that you're either going to go into the labor fields or or there's such a sometimes some some negative influences surrounding the city. Obviously, there's a, there's a lot of great people, and I think you know the Garcias are one example of that. But when you have such so many temptations, uh, just to see you know the guys that have come out of there and and have become excellent representatives of what can be done through hard work and through dedicating yourself to a sport, I think this film is like you know, captures that with uh, both, you know, Mr. Garcia, Robert, you know, we talk about, you know, Fernando Vargas, we talk about Bam Bam, Mikey, and those guys as well. And I think it's just, it's just a great story to tell, and, and I'm very proud to be a part of, of, you know, the process of bringing that to, to an audience. Is that something that you would want to do down the line, you know, I mean, besides what you do in the ring and what you do for the sport of boxing, but I mean, to have voiceovers or to have narrating jobs or to do stuff like that, is that something you're open to as well? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, I, it's stuff that I do on a regular basis. I have a, a Pro Tool studio here at home where, you know, the modern technology has gotten to the point where you can, you know, for lack of a better term, you can be recording in your chones and, and, you know, you record a voiceover, send it over by email, P3, and, and it's playing on radio the very next day. As a matter of fact, recently, I, uh, there's a fighter by the name of Joey Gilbert out of Reno. He fought at a, at a relatively high level, and uh, he's a lawyer now. And uh, through Facebook, as a matter of fact, he got in touch with me. And he said, look, I want you to do my commercials here in, uh, in Reno for, for the Spanish-speaking audience. And I said, hey, man, that'd be fantastic. So once again, uh, you know, I got a little bit more deeper into it than I thought. We started writing some spots, came up with a concept for the commercial. I did it here at home, MP3'd it, sent it to him, and it's, and it's playing in, in Reno, Nevada now. So, yeah, it's stuff that I do. Uh, I, I don't do it as often as I'd like. But it's certainly something that, uh, that, yeah, I think it's it's like everything else. Once you, you do it more often, you get better at it, uh, more people start to know about you. And, and like I said, if you do good work, I think they'll call you back.
I remember seeing uh, Michael Buffer having to show about, uh, I think it was something about the le- legendary fights, and he narrated some kind of show like that. I mean, you knowing Spanish very well, I mean, I, I know on ESPN we don't see too many uh, uh, Spanish fighters there, but, you know, you knowing Spanish very well, I mean, I, I think it'd be awesome to bring back some of these old guys like Ruben Olivares or Julio Cesar Chavez or Carlos Sarate or Lupe Pintor and so on and so forth, bringing all these guys and getting their story down and interviewing them one at a time, you know, and, and doing something like that. I know that there's a big audience for that, for Hispanics, and, you, damn, I mean, uh, you'd be that, that perfect and only representative that I could think of that would be able to pull it off. You know what? I need to hire you as my agent, man. Because <laughs> I'd certainly be open to it. It's uh, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunities out there. Certainly, uh, the key to it is just finding the right connections and finding the right person to to make all those things happen. And um, and you know, any opportunities that might arise. You know, I've had a lot of things happen for me in in this business that you know I, I never thought. You know, I've had the chance to to play a small role in the movie. I've had the chance to do you know, like commercials, uh, voiceovers. So there's a lot of opportunities out there. It's just a matter of taking advantage of them and, and uh, you being the right fit for, for what is being sold or what is being produced. And, and like I said, I'm certainly open to any ideas that are out there. You know, one time a while back I interviewed a, a ring announcer and he said that his job, he didn't see it like very important. He saw it like it was just a, a whatever thing and just another thing. But, you know, I think I, I feel totally opposite of that. Uh, you know, I, I every time I go watch a fight, the only things I think about and I get excited about is knowing that, you know, while I'm driving to the event or the venue or whatever, the first things that come to mind is I can't wait to see this guy walk in, do his entrance, the ring announcer, announce his name, and, you know, all that stuff. Because you guys do steer the emotions of the crowd for that moment that they're in their way to get announced and waiting for their name to be thrown out there to everybody. That's what we look forward to. That's what we always remember, and that's how we remember the fight for the rest of our lives, is when you guys announce names, when we stand up to cheer, you know, before the fight and after the fight, you know, if they did win or lose. But you guys are important, and no matter what anybody says, a ring announcer does steer the crowd and to do whatever they want them to do, if you really think about it. You guys are the MCs. You guys are a, a big factor in every event, in every card that happens. And I appreciate everything you guys do. And Lupe, thank you very much for returning to theboxingbar.com, man. And I appreciate everything you do and for you just to come on here. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate the kind words and, and uh, any chance you or any time I can come on and, and uh, converse with you. I look forward to it. And uh, hopefully we won't have to wait a year and a half next time. <laughs> Will do, Lupe. Thank you very much, my man, and have yourself a good night. All right, take care.